Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Lobfruit Podcast. And today our guest is Lee Nelson. Lee Hello. Ethical High Raw Vegan since 2014. He is a father, husband, environmental advocate, holistic health coach, yoga instructor, Tai Chi teacher, Reiki practitioner, and dream interpreter. Lee has studied and completed courses in metaphysics, natural hygiene, and nonviolent communication. His hobbies include running, reading, and gardening. And I think, Lee, you've got like the best email address. <laughs> supreme life force at gmail.com yeah thank you where does yeah, that and that from? that that comes from tai chi um, okay yeah so tai chi is um it's a chinese um chinese word and the way that i interpret tai chi is supreme life force uh, tai, the tai can mean supreme or ultimate and chi means life force uh, yeah and what's, what's the, what does that mean in, in the philosophy of Tai Chi? Like, what does that actually represent? Right, yeah. So um, it's kind of the goal or the practice of Tai Chi is ultimate life force. It's to, to be your ultimate true self, to be and express your ultimate true self, to, um, to live fully, right? Yeah. Right, right. I've I've been um, uh, practicing a martial art called Aikido for many years. So I, yeah, there's some kind of similarity there, and that's the the thing that interested me about it was I was quite interested in this idea of the esoteric energy thing. You know, mm -hmm. I'm kind of interested in exploring that and seeing if there was any any reality to that. And um, and I think I. I've done. I've only done a few classes of Tai Chi, but I feel like this is probably trying to hit on something similar or trying to cultivate something similar. And um, what have been what have been some of your experiences with that? Before we get into all the yeah, all the, I, I mean I'm that's kind of interested in this topic. <laughs> yeah, the tai, tai Chi is is pretty deep in my story. Um, tai Chi is where I first felt that energy. What what you're talking about. Um, after practicing daily for about six months, I started to feel something. I was like, what is this? What is going on here? Um, started Just started feeling the energy flowing through my body. Um, and that's kind of, that is what got me into Reiki and some other things is feeling the energy through Tai Chi. Um, yeah, so it's, it's part of my daily practice. One of my warmups is doing a Tai Chi. Um, and yeah, for me, it's more about the health and the, um, the energetic aspect. I, Tai Chi, you can use it martially, but the, the roots of Tai Chi is for health and well being. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, I remember being in like Chinatown in New York and seeing people practice Tai Chi and older people practice right. stuff in the park. Yeah. I like that. I think it's really cool. Yeah, um, and you mentioned there uh, the six months of practice. So, how do you um, how do you think about that's what you call a supreme life force? Like, how do you is it something that is within us that we cultivate, or is it something that we try and tap into and allow it to flow? Um. Yeah, I think it's both. I think right. ultimately it is um, it, I mean the ultimate supreme life force, the divine source, right what what we might call God, I believe is everything, is everywhere in everything, everyone. Um, but you can also kind of break it down to where it's like this is my life force. And my life force is also connected to my soul and my higher self. Yeah. And so that is you're connecting into something deeper, but I can also cultivate that and express it. And my personal life force here in this human existence can grow and manifest. Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. I was speaking to a guy recently who was talking about having like a Kundalini 
awakening and this essentially this sort of experience for about four years where he had this energy going through his body and and in his words kind of blowing all his internal circuits and kind of like you, you talk about the idea that we've got all these filters in us that sort of stop us from uh maybe experiencing certain things or they hold us back or they make us think in certain ways or they um and and he just he, he just talked about how some of these would just disappear mm, yeah and i i i, I think about that sometimes with the idea of like this idea of energy or this flow of energy that we kind of we have this access there's access to it but we sort of are blocked or we hold back from it in some way or we kind of mm -hmm. our mind has so many fixed ideas or whatever it is that kind of uh, manifesting more yeah yeah i i am i believe very in a very similar way that um for example if if we are uh eternal souls and so we're a soul before we come into this human experience and that soul is much grander right has access to a lot more um awareness and a lot more uh just everything and so, but as we choose to come into this human experience, we say, okay, I'm going to forget all that. I'm going to forget that. I'm going to act as if this is a brand new experience. And we come in here with this uh, kind of clean slate to have this experience. And then, yeah, we come into the human, um, the societal, all these structures and these mind um, things that, that kind of block us from from receiving our all of this uh divine inheritance that we uh you know is our divine inheritance that we can tap into but that's part of why we come here is to to do that to to move through all of these structures uh and get back to our true self interesting so let's get to your story a little bit uh, sure is there anything you'd like to say about yourself in introduction because I, I, obviously I, I read out a little bit there, but anything else you want to say before we get into more of your story? Uh, no, yeah, I wrote that for you as the introduction. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, did you did did you grow up in a mainstream, or kind of uh, mainstream kind of a diet, regular kind of upbringing? Yeah. So yeah, and this is actually pretty interesting. I grew up on a dairy farm. Oh wow. So I, I, I grew up in you know, the, the traditional US, um, you know, the sad type diet, eating a lot of dairy products. Um, um, I grew up in a more rural area. So it's pretty rural on a farm kind of out in the middle of nowhere in California on the West Coast. Oh, wow. Um, and, it, you know, now looking back, you know, I've been a, a, an ethical vegan for over eight years. And looking back, I see this like really disconnect with myself, with my younger self, okay. uh, because I loved animals. I've always loved animals, always, you know, yeah. and I would I would go to the dairy farm and I would pet the cows and be with them and talk to them and then I'd go home and eat them. <laughs> and, you know, and when I look back now, I'm like, that is so sad. That's but that was the indoctrination. You know, everyone was telling me we had to eat meat in order to survive. And, you know, I didn't know any vegetarians or vegans until I was in my 20s. I just, it, it didn't even register as that was an option. Yeah. 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 So when you, I, growing up, did you have any, any health issues at all? Um, let's see, I had, Gla I have contacts now. I had glasses when I was pretty young, uh, like first grade, really young, had glasses. Um, uh, it's funny because whenever I ask people about that, they never say anything about their eyesight. So yeah, well, this is uh, one thing that's big to me. I've, uh, do you know Dr. Bates? Um, I've heard of the Bates, the Bates method. method. Yeah. I've yeah. used the Bates, the Bates method and I've improved my eyesight quite a bit. Uh, and I think 
eating mostly raw, you know, how it's helped a lot with that too. Right, uh, yeah. And I, and in my metaphysics training, we do eye exercises too. Um, yeah. So I had, let's see, I, I mean, I got sick like a regular kid. I didn't have any big health issues. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing major. I, yeah, you know, sure. I would get sick here and there. I used to get like fevers during the summertime, some kind of weird things, but nothing yeah. major. Did you yeah. have a, uh, any kind of religious upbringing? Yeah, uh, my family was pretty, um, uh, pretty religious in the Bible. Like we would read the Bible a lot, um, but and pray pretty often, but we didn't go to church a lot. So we had a it was a more spiritual upbringing that where we were trying to have a more connection with, uh, with Jesus. Um, so in a way, yeah, it was, um, you know, kind of the traditional uh, Christian upbringing, but it wasn't super strict. We didn't go to church a lot. Yeah. 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 And uh so what, what kind of came first? Was it your interest in the sort of met, metaphysical, spiritual side of things, or was it the, the transition toward veganism, or did it all um, how, how did that all work for you? Spiritual came first. So when I was 23, 24, I got married and got divorced. And when I got divorced, that was a huge uh, shakeup for me. Within one year? Yeah, I, I was only married for eight months. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that was huge for me because I was like, well, I'm going to go to hell now. I, oh, really? you know, I, um, she left me, the, my ex-wife, she left me and I was like, should I still be faithful to her? Should I, what should I do? Right. And uh, so I started like researching a lot of different religions and a lot of different things. And I, and I kept asking this myself, these questions because I had a lot of friends who were not Christian, um, who were Muslim, who were, uh, Wiccan or, uh, kind of new age spirituality or different, different religions, different things. And I was like, you know, these people are really genuinely nice, kind people, why would they go to hell? Like, that doesn't make sense to me, right? <laughs> and, and I just did a lot of research and a lot of praying and a lot. Um, and I came across uh, Edgar Casey. Have you ever uh -huh. heard of him? Yeah, I have, yeah. Um, and I just, I love Edgar Casey. I started reading all of his stuff and I was like, oh, this really made sense. And for me, it kind of blended the, the religion with kind of the new age spirituality and some of these other religions that I started um, looking through and kind of Buddhism and some different things. And, uh, so I kind of developed this, um, maybe my own take on spirituality. And then I got into metaphysics, which, you know, really took that to a whole new level. Um, so that came first before the veganism. Yeah. What do you, what do you mean by metaphysics? So metaphysics, uh, so physics is the study of reality, of physical reality, right? Metaphysics is the study of non-physical reality. So it's studying of the mind um, and of kind of the universal laws of the way things work. Uh, in metaphysics, we learn um, about meditation, how to meditate, what does that mean? Uh, we also learn about dream interpretation. That's where I got my dream interpretation from, because we can use these, um, these laws of the mind and the way the mind works to interpret dreams oh, wow. uh, and to get messages from our higher self. Interesting. Yeah. What, how, where do you go to, to train in that or, or learn that? Is that a specific school or? Yeah, so there are, there are different schools. Uh, the one that I went to specifically is called the School of Metaphysics, and it's based in Missouri. Um, I did a distance training, and it's really, it was like a college, right? So it's really in-depth, intense, and there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of practices to do with it. Uh, but the way it is, is I had one mentor and I would receive lessons in the mail and I would have these lessons. I would go over them, do the, the exercises 
and I would have a mentor that I would call at least once a week and we would email back and forth. Um, and it took me, it took me a year and a half to do the first cycle. Um, and that's all I did was first cycle. You can do four cycles. And if you do four cycles, that's like a four year university and you can get um, a doctorate in, in uh, metaphysics. That's really interesting. Yeah. And who is it that came up with the, the course and everything and the, the syllabus? Um, the, the coursework is heavily influenced by Edgar Casey. Right. Um, I don't know who the originator was of it, but it yeah, it's influenced by Edgar Casey and his work. Um, but it's con it's it's been continued. It's grown upon that. Um, and they also teach uh, past life regression. Any insight into the kind of exercises that you that you were put through for that? Yeah. Uh, so some of the exercises have to do with dream interpretation. So you, you learn how to remember your dreams, write them down, interpret them. Uh, some of the exercises are eye exercises and uh, some of them are mental. Um, so it's like training your mind, right? So it's mental attention focus. So for example, one of the exercises is looking at a candle flame so you look at this candle flame and you do this exercise for 10 minutes and you look at the candle flame and you have a piece of paper and a pencil and you become the observer of your mind while you're watching this candle flame. You want to have a clear mind and not be thinking anything. But as soon as a thought or something comes into your mind, you make a mark on this paper and then you let the thought go and you focus again wow. on the candle. So it's teaching you, um, to how to focus your mind and clear your mind as well. I like that. It's, it's, it's makes me think about how easy it is for us to become distracted by almost anything. And I've, right. I've been trying to sit down and get very focused on working on various things recently. And um, I, I try and observe the different things that come into my mind or even the feelings in my body that make me that are sort of trying to distract me away sometimes and I like mm. music so I really love music but if I, I, I have to kind of let that go rather than okay I'm going to put music on in the background because right you know that, that that's kind of distracting sometimes but but yeah no that seems really interesting Lee I've, I've never heard about that school uh, I've always been interested in trying to find some is interest like find some um like some actual, uh, yeah, lessons like that, or um, I can't think of the word you used for it, uh, teachings or exercises, sorry, yeah, exercises mm. that actually help you develop these things. So that, that's interesting. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not really well um advertised <laughs> they I, they don't do a good job advertising really and you know the website is not that great um because they're so focused on the physical attributes of what you do and it's all volunteer based the whole school right. is, is volunteer based all the teachers and everything well wow. um so some of the things like advertising get left out a little bit but yeah Sure, sure. So, well, how so? How did you start to make the other lifestyle changes then towards veganism, towards raw foods? Right. So, when I was let's see, twenty six, twenty seven, somewhere around there, um, I was working at a, I was working as an environmental chemist at a laboratory, and we had a health fair, and a, we had a chiropractor that came in there to the health fair. And this chiropractor, you know, when I was in line and I came up to him, he just looked at me and he's like, your neck is super crooked. <laughs> so I, I started going to this chiropractor and one of the first things he did, he's like, uh, bend over and touch your toes. And I couldn't do it, you know, at 26, right? I was super inflexible. So I started stretching every day and then I started working out. I started doing P90X. Do you know what 
P90X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, so I started be doing P90X, loved it. My favorite video of P90X was the yoga video. So I got into yoga, loved yoga. Um, but so I'm in, so I'm in the gym and I'm working out a lot and I'm like, you know, I'm kind of this typical skinny white guy, but I'm like, oh yeah, I want to get buff, right? I want to get big. <laughs> Everybody tells me you got to eat more protein. You got to eat more <laughs> meat. So I started eating a lot of meat, a lot. Um, and in general, I started eating a lot of food in general. So I was eating close to like 6,000 calories a day. Whoa. And I, was, I wasn't getting big, <laughs> you know, and I started feeling bad. I'm like, what is going on? I feel bad. I'm not getting big. This isn't working. What's going on? And then what, there was one night that was really a tipping point for me. So I was, um, I was cooking ground beef on the stove and the aroma of it, the smell of it just overwhelmed me. And I was overcome with a feeling of anguish of these cows of like, and I was like, I can't do this. I can't eat this. I can't do this. Um, so I didn't eat it, but I was still in that space of everybody was telling me you have to eat meat to survive. I didn't know any vegetarians. So I became a pescatarian for two years, um, which is just eating fish and then you know, vegetables, right? Um, and that actually worked fairly well for me, but I was still like, something doesn't feel right. Um, at that time, I also started dating someone who was a vegetarian. So then I was kind of like, okay, maybe there's this, the, there's this other way to go. Um, but it was, it was when I got into my yoga training and my Reiki training. When I was doing Reiki training, um during that period of time i was like i'm gonna cut out all animal products and and i thought i would go back i was like oh, i'm just doing it for this like three month period where i'm doing this training um you know because i grew up on a dairy farm and i've all i had always drank a lot of milk every day and i was like oh i'll go back to uh like vegetarian um but after two weeks without it, I didn't want it. I was like, nope, I don't want it. I don't need it. I'm done. <laughs> um, and so then, then it was just, well, how do I be the healthiest on this vegan diet, right? Because right at first I started eating a lot of nuts and that was not good. You know, eating a lot of nuts did not work for me. Um, so I was just searching around like, what do I do? How do you do this the healthiest? And I came across the 801010, Doug Graham's book. And I went to one of his retreats in Washington, in, you know, on the West Coast in Washington. Sure. And I, I met Doug Graham and Grant Campbell and some of those older guys. And then there was also some uh, young girls at this retreat in their 20s and 30s who'd been raw um, for like five or 10 years. And but seeing all these people who are doing raw vegan and just the amount of energy they had, what they were doing, you know, Grant Campbell doing these super long races and Doug lifting these really big weights and everything. And I was like, OK, th this looks like it's it. Um, Doug's work in 801010 really resonated with me, you know, because people are like, oh, that's so extreme eating raw. But then. I'm looking at all these animals and saying, hey, humans are the only animals that are eating cooked food on the planet. So maybe something, maybe we're missing something here, really. Um, so yeah, that was kind of how I got into it. It took me a while to transition. I did, uh, I did like the, the raw till dinner, you know, raw till four for a while. Um, and then was kind of back, back and forth between raw and having a little bit of cooked here and there. Um, but mo I've been mostly raw for uh, so, uh, almost ever since I've been vegan because it didn't take me that yeah. long to figure out. How did, how did you actually come across the 81010 book? Um, 
I think I just found it online, just searching. Sure. Yeah. And and what year was it you went to the retreat? Uh, it was either 2014 or 2015, somewhere right. in there. Right, so quite quite far back then. Yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, yeah, I went to, it was Doug Grant, it was the first one that he did on like family. It was something around family. And the, it was a shorter one. It was like four days. And I was like, okay, I can afford that. I can do that. He, he had a shorter retreat. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And I, I've seen you at Woodstock. I don't know how many times you've been there. I've been there twice. Yeah. 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 And what was your impression of that event? Um, yeah, I, I love Woodstock. I think it's a really great place to have community um, because it's hard to find this style of community. So here in Michigan, this is really interesting. There is a raw foods group here, but it's not raw vegan. They do like raw milk, raw honey, raw oh, wow. weird stuff. Um, and they, you know, they they do high fat as well. Um, and then there, I, I mean, I prefer the vegan community over the raw community if it's not raw vegan, right? Um, but yeah, the, there's just something about having the, the raw vegan community. Um, yeah, but sometimes it's, it, I don't know. There, there's also something around this whole idea of, and I think you talk about this too, of like the, the detox portion of it. And um, I don't know, there, there's another. Well, that's, that's funny because what's interesting to me is that you found Doug and you found 80, 10, 10, right? Mm -hmm. and, but a lot of people that have the, the more spiritual side of themselves, they get into the detox thing because they see it as a path to sort of further their spiritual path. And sometimes it's that's true. a bad thing because they end up like, um, you know, getting into the detox mindset and kind of going down this path of maybe trying to eat less and less and all these kind of things that people sometimes fall into. It's true. And I did that. I did it. <laughs> I found Dr. Morse and I did a lot of his, you know, some, I did some of his dry fasting and some of his other stuff. And then I also, um, I went to Costa Rica and I did a 21 day fast with Lauren Lockman. All right, cool. Um, and spiritually, yes, I had great spiritual, um, you know, uh, experience with that but physically it took me a while to recover and I, just physically I don't think fasting all the time is a great thing what, uh, what, was, what yeah. was it you were actually doing what was what was the regimen you were sort of doing but which what do you mean w were you fasting quite a lot from what you were saying there um th through different periods uh for example, I think I was following Dr. Morse for like six months or something. And yeah, I was fasting at least once a month for a couple of days and then doing a, um, a dry fast here and there. And I was doing periods of like uh, mono mealing with only grapes for a while. Right. And it's, it's, it's hard to eat enough when you're mono mealing. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, the, the fast with, uh, with Lauren Lockman was a little bit different because that was like, okay, here's this one fast. I'm going to do it this one time. And yeah, it's a big fast, but um, it, it has this, this purpose, right? And it, for me, it was a much more spiritual purpose. Um, so to me, that's a little bit different. So yeah, yeah. yeah if you feel spiritually called, do it one time get it over with uh and then you can have fasting as part of your routine uh but i would say maybe two or three times a year like don't do it every week 
<laughs> yeah. So yeah. So um, with firstly with Bob Morse, like, did you do some of the herbs and things as well? Do you think there's? Any... I did some of the herbs. Yeah. Does um, he actually encourage dry fasting? I, I didn't really think he encouraged it that much. At least from what I remember, yeah. Oh really? He does. Um, especially one of his proteges. Um, I forget what her name is, but she really encourages it. Hildy um, Larson? Yes, Hildy. Uh-huh. Do you know that she passed away recently? No, I didn't know that. She passed away about six weeks ago, maybe? Oh, pretty, pretty recent. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, it's interesting that you said that because I interviewed her like a couple of months before and, and um, she was... Even on the interview, she was talking about like being in bed, not being able to get out of bed and doing all this intense detox and stuff. And um, when I heard that she passed away, I, I, my immediate thought, and this is something that I start to think about now is when, when I hear about someone passing away that's like fairly young and healthy and is in this raw vegan community is I, I wonder if they've been dry fasting because it, yeah. it, can take that too far and it really in the wrong situation is it's really dangerous yeah I'm not sure 100 if that's what happened with her but it, it, it seems like the last post she made prior to dying was was like she was doing some kind of intense detox stuff and she didn't really say what she was doing but you know um i guess it could have been some something related to dry fasting i don't really know yeah that's it's sad, um, you know, and my because I have I did a lot of training um, around natural hygiene with uh, Dr. David Klein. Oh, wow. Um, really connected so to I went, yeah. yeah, I went through his um, his training program. But he, you know, he died fairly recently as well, sure. um, which was really sad, too. Uh, but he yeah, he was he he wasn't he was big in fasting but for a reason right not just you know every day trying to yeah. detox kind of yeah my well my understanding with david was i mean i i I'd spoken to him a couple of times and i always wondered why he was quite um like not part of things anymore so much like he wasn't at any of the festivals and he didn't he wasn't very public and he didn't have any videos and things like that. And uh, I think that he was probably from, from what I've heard from people that were close to him, that he actually wasn't very well. And, and he, his lungs had become injured from what I've heard from uh, breathing in this stuff, diatomaceous earth, that, that, that he had an experience with that. It damaged his lungs almost irreparably and he was just he was trying to um i mean he, he obviously lived quite long after that but he never quite regained his health after that and and his death involved pneumonia i think some kind of complication with inflammation mm. or pneumonia so yes yeah, it's, it's really sad and um i was actually speaking to doug graham about it and he said that when the lungs get damaged they don't tend to repair like yeah, you've just got you've just got so much. There's so many whatever it is the things in your lungs like they just get damaged over time and they don't repair. And if you damage them a lot, then there's there's you know there's no recovery from it entirely. So I don't know. Yeah. I'd, I'd heard that Dave might have been really suffering for quite a long time. Yeah, especially from from an outside source like from an inside source if you're doing something uh, like smoking to damage the lungs i think you can repair them but when you're inhaling um particles like diatomaceous earth and they get stuck in there yeah there's not a great yeah. way for them to get out i don't know what the difference is i think with smoking is like there's a buildup of tar and and maybe that can clean out but i don't know the diatomaceous earth, there must be a different type of damage. And yeah, yeah, it's and, and it's one of those sad things as well where it's clear to me that from it seems to me that he was looking for a less damaging natural alternative 
to normal like insecticide that yeah using he, he was trying butter. to he was trying to get rid of uh fleas for his cat yeah and uh yeah it's it's really pretty sad. sad and he you know his um what what i find the saddest part is that his his school that he was building um it's all gone now right yeah like he you know he was building this school and it was um and he was trying to build um a place in hawaii like an actual physical school there too um but yeah he didn't he didn't have any he didn't provide he didn't build a legacy with it he didn't like yeah uh, he didn't have uh you know some of us who graduated from his school i wish he had given us permission to to help him run yeah. school yeah 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 because now you know his uh his family isn't doing anything with it right so what let's go through natural hygiene then and you probably learned a bunch from doug as well but what for you what is natural hygiene what are the main kind of philosophies that you've taken from it um for me the the main philosophies in natural hygiene um so actually for me personally like i like to take natural hygiene and uh maslow's hierarchy of needs wow. and kind yeah. of put them together nice um so because it's not just the food right and i and i think that's a really important part of natural hygiene is like you've got to look at all your needs and and me as a as a new father as a pretty new father you know sleep is way up there <laughs> uh, you know so you got to look at your sleep your routine your daily routine are you getting enough sunshine are you getting enough clean water um and then some of the social uh social needs as well do you have social support do you have um do you have activity do you physical activity uh you know there's a lot of these needs that um are on a daily basis we need every day uh so to me that that's really the basis of natural hygiene is kind of looking at um the human environment and what the human needs to thrive the the basic needs um yes diet is is one of them and we do focus on that a lot but it's not everything right yeah 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 and and to me i think to really make a healthy lifestyle work especially a raw vegan lifestyle and do it long term i think you need to incorporate some of these natural hygiene philosophies i think you need to have these like rooted in your core like yeah like you have to really understand these things and it's it's what it's it's kind of like the the center or the anchor like whenever you have doubts or worries or you know other people are doing other things or you hear ideas about other different ways of living or you know see people do different things you can always come back to these principles and these teachings of hygiene and it always kind of makes you just have this this center to come back to of these very co very common sense very practical like totally make sense ideas like you know about the ideal kind of diet about um uh, just the things about like the ideal diet for any animal is mm -hmm. food that is like that it can eat in its raw state enjoyably you know just and, yeah yeah Oh yeah, well, what what else could that be apart from fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds? Like the the rest of it kind of doesn't quite make sense. Um, but yeah, how how was that experience with David? And, and the, did you was that another thing by mail or was it email or was it online video um, that process? Yeah, so the school with David was online. Uh, that was also kind of like a college. He. Um, that took me quite a few years to go through his program. And that was because, I, uh, which I love this about his program is that you could go at your own pace. Right. Um, so I did it pretty slowly, I, you know, um, but yeah, it was like writing papers, doing research, uh, really, yeah, I studied the history of natural hygiene. Nice. Um, 
and then uh, I would have phone calls with David. Oh, nice. You know? And he's just one of the kindest guys I've ever known. And he was, yeah, he was a great mentor to me. Um, you know, and he helped me and my wife, Abby, through some tough times. And uh, it, that, yeah, you know, and because when I was first looking for different programs, different ways to get like certified to be a health coach and to do this, um, I, I really liked the depth of, of his program and that you could do it at your own pace. But it was also one of the cheapest ones out there, too. You know, and he he really like worked with you and would help you out with everything. Um, yeah, he, it, that was just an amazing experience. Amazing, yeah, yeah. He was a great guy. Was what what what's what was some of the stuff you studied? Did you did you read some of the like Herbert Shelton material? Yeah, back to like you know Tilden and all that stuff or. Trump yeah troll and all that or yeah so the, there was um you know and again i wish all that stuff was still there i i ha i don't have access to it anymore um seriously yeah seriously it's it's gone which is really sad but yeah cuz dr klein what he did was he took this material um from shelton and uh some of the other ones and then he would add to it so it would have his own writing and their writing. Sure. Um, and he would have all these papers. Um, and then he had lectures too. So you, I could listen to lectures uh, that he had or Shelton had or different ones. Um, uh, it was really cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah so uh, how, I, I guess, where, where has it went for you? since then so you've um you've went on a period of learning and changing your diet and and all that and where are you at now are you trying to help others with that is it something that you just there's just kind of a passion of yours or an interest or is it not really something you're focused on at the moment where, where are you at with all that stuff right um so i tried a little bit to to make this kind of my my full-time gig right it's just so hard, like the advertising and everything. I don't really like that. I don't like sure, the advertising sure. part. Um, and so let's see, it's been four, almost four years that I've been married. And that completely changed my life. Like yeah, being yeah, married, yeah. family, right? And so, and like I was telling you before we, um, before you started uh, recording on this, we, uh, I met my wife in Tennessee. We were living in Tennessee. And then we decided to move to Michigan for her to get her PhD. She is a, um, a therapist and she's getting her PhD um, at MSU here in Michigan. Um, and so she, she gets a stipend, but it's not that much. So I have to be the main person to make a lot, to make the money for our family. Um, so I'm working for an environmental advocacy agency um, it's kind of a startup business. There's only four of us in it. Um, I like, I'm helping build the website and build, um, basically we're doing a lot of research on everything environmentally uh, related. And so we have one guy who's like a PhD in mathematician and he'll get all the stats, all the data, and then he'll give it to me. I'll build a graph and be like, okay, this is how we're going to explain it in layman's terms, you know, nice. uh, and show a graph. Um, so, yeah, that is awesome because I work from home. I can do it from anywhere um, and it's steady income. So I'm good with that. So the, you know, the health coaching on the side, I do it with friends and family. I, you know, and I feel like the more that I think about it and the more I do it, I'm like, this should really be taught in school. It should be taught to our kids. I don't feel great about you know, asking people to pay a lot of money for this, you know? Um, so it's kind of on, a, on the side, uh, a gig. Sure. Uh, I also, I teach yoga on the side. I teach Tai Chi. I do a lot of other things. Um, 
you know, and now I have a, a, a one-year-old son. So a lot of my time is taken up with that, you know. Uh, yeah, I want to be a role model and a mentor and have a really good relationship with him, which I do. And that is fantastic. I, I love being a father. Um, yeah, you know, and I'm not... Uh, I've had to like come to grips with not being completely raw sometimes because, for example, uh, we've had a lot of issues here with supply chain because of COVID and because of some other things going on. Like, you know, and it's Michigan, it's northern US, the fruit quality here is not great in general, <laughs> but this winter has been rough. The, like, all the mangoes, you open them up and they're gray. It's just disgusting. <laughs> and so I've, I've had to add some cooked vegetables to some steamed vegetables for dinner sometimes. And it's not a big deal. I don't feel super, I know it's not ideal, but it's not bad, you know? And uh, for me, the biggest thing is no fats. Yeah. For me, I, if I get too many fats in my system, it, it's not good. Um, so steamed yeah. vegetables now and then, not a big deal yeah yeah I, i'm with you on the fats like i just think that almost straight away even even like i even sometimes think about an avocado like something just too much something i feel like that's too much <laughs> just, <laughs> i'm just like oh I, I just feel sort of brought down by it a little bit and yeah sometimes you want that maybe you're trying to you're looking for that but yeah no, well, it's been great to speak to you, Lee, and get to know you a bit better. And if, so let's say someone did want to reach out to you, maybe can they send you an email or something? Or Yeah, for sure. Uh, which is that Supreme Life Force at Gmail. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Um, any last kind of thoughts? Any last? Uh, um, uh, just a, uh, yeah, it's just the privilege to be here to share with you. Thank you for asking me to do this to share, um, and for all that you do, I I think it's great. Uh, you you keep um, you know inter you you keep it interesting with all the different people that you do. It's not just the normal people, right? You know, because <laughs> sometimes I think there's a lot of us who are just kind of living our normal life right and not really out i'm not on youtube yeah, or yeah, anything yeah. nobody can find me <laughs> so yeah thank you for for doing but i like yeah i like that though i, I like because it's, it's funny because i've contacted a few people and they've been raw vegan like 10 or 15 years or whatever and and i say to them would you like to do an interview and they go uh Oh, I'm not really, I don't, I, I, my business is doing something else now. You know, they say, they use some phrase like that. They say, oh, my business focuses in some other area. And, and I'm like, what are you talking about business? Like, it's not for business. Yeah. Like, it's... I'm just talking, just to the, I get it. Like, it might have been about that, or it might have been about like, like they were trying to get out there to, to um, get attention for themselves and everything. But I, I, I I'm, to me, it is interesting to find people that aren't doing it as a business, that aren't yeah. really necessarily pursuing it, that are doing it as a lifestyle. And and because I think ultimately the whole point is not not for it to become the obsession in your life, but for it to become kind of like you're saying, something that everyone should have known as a child. Yeah, exactly. Easily into their life. And then that being the foundation, the health and the energy you get from that being the foundation for the rest of your life. To, to, to fuel all the other activities of life. And, um, and actually those things working together help a person to be, to be even healthier because if you're focused on, you know, how do I, on, on other activities and getting better at those and, and whether it's sports or whether it's in your work or even relationships and things, you want to feel at your best in order, in order to do these things at your best. So that mm -hmm. and more motivation to to continue to to eat well and improve how you eat and and improve your sleep and things like that so right feeds into your ability to pursue and achieve other things you know? yeah for sure and natural hygiene does talk about um kind of 
having purpose in life, being a big part of health. Right. Productive work and um yeah, once you get those base needs met, then you can move up to the higher needs, the you know, the, uh, yeah. the mental needs and the spiritual needs and the emotional needs. Yeah. I love the like the Maslow's hierarchy and that kind of thing. I I I one time I was trying to like think, well, I started the process of thinking about how would you bring together all these different like psychology things so to have this total understanding of how the human mind works or how how our motivation systems work and everything like so like maslow's mm -hmm. needs is one part of that yeah there's like things like um what was it some someone was when i was at the amazon for festival one of the guys was talking about the dunning kruger effect or something and like and the various biases that the human mind has so there's like a certain series of uh typical biases that the human mind sort of is prone to and I thought it'd be cool if you could work out all these different things and kind of learn them and have this really good understanding of your of your own mind um but there's, there's a bunch there's a bunch of others yeah well and you can just observe your mind observe sure. because you know different people grew up in different households and different structures um and and so and we also have different personalities. So I think it is really important to observe your own mind, your own thoughts, and to be like, why did I think that? Why, where is that coming from? It, you know, yeah. is that an original thought of mine? Did it come from someone else? Did it come from society? Um, and just doing that, you you really do get to know yourself a lot better, what your personal motivations are. Um, and it's that that's I think that's more the way to go. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Lee, for taking some. Yeah. I uh, look forward to seeing you again sometime, and I, I certainly would like to catch up with you another time and maybe do a second part to this and we'll sure. with the other topics a bit more. But yeah. uh, for the audience that are watching and listening, thank you for spending the time and giving us a bit of your attention uh, to check out the Love Fruit podcast, and feel free to share this with others or a comment on this give us a like a review whatever you can do to help us would be nice any feedback you can send any feedback to info at fruitbest.co.uk and um, part of the reason that we have these podcasts to some degree is to help promote our festival uh, the uk fruit fest fruitbest.co.uk you can have a look at that if you like but uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you in another episode of the love fruit podcast